Well, welcome to today's History Upper Ohio Valley. I'm your host, Bob Connors, and we have an excellent guest today, someone that I really respect and am so proud that you decided to come here and visit us. Thank you, Bob. Sharon, great it is see great you. to have you here, and you are Ohio State Supreme Court Justice. I am the 154th Justice of the Ohio Supreme Court and the ninth woman to serve at the court. And it's Sharon Kennedy. You got that Kennedy name going for you. I do. The love <laughs> of the Irish. <laughs> And we all love Irish. <laughs> anyway, I want to just uh, ask you one question before we really get going here about what drew you to do what you're doing to become a Supreme Court Justice? That's a pretty lofty goal in life. What, what attracted you there? Bob, I have to tell you that really it's a life journey. Uh, it is the Robert Frost poem, The Road Not Taken. Mm -hmm. As I tell many young people as I speak in high schools, junior highs, that you actually have to look at my pathway to justice of the Supreme Court of Ohio by way of the poem. Mm -hmm. So Robert Frost writes that you can, walking down a path, you see the end so very clearly, and all of a sudden as you're walking on that path, another path verges, er, emerges from the woods. It wants for wear, you can't really see around the bend, the growth is over, and you choose to take that path. And that's really how my life unfolded. I started very earnest at 10 years old of all I wanted to do was to be a police officer. And I achieved that. But serving in law enforcement was when I really had the opportunity to meet a lawyer and a judge. And it reminded me of the conversation. It was five minutes. In a lifetime, it's probably five minutes of throwaway. But my teacher, Mr. Shearing, made such an impression on me I had taken elective, a general law class, and at the end of the class, he said, Sharon, you excelled so well at this, you got straight A's, you can tell you're very passionate about the law. Law enforcement is not a ceiling, it's a floor. And I actually, at 17, told Mr. Shearing it wasn't possible for somebody like me. Um, my parents were born into the Great Depression. My dad grew up in public housing, and my mom grew up in a three-room cottage. I was the first to go to college in my family. So for my socioeconomic upbringing, never, metting, ne never having met a judge or a lawyer, I really believe that was beyond my grasp. Even though yeah. the rules are very simple for achieving your American dream, according to my parents, decide, commit, work hard, have fortitude. That's it. Those are the only rules. But really looking at what a lawyer was, I thought in my mind at 17, having never met one, I just really felt that it was someone that came from great affluence or generational lawyers or their parents were doctors or dentists, not somebody like me. Mm -hmm. But law enforcement was that pathway. I saw it very clearly, but all of a sudden you meet your first lawyer and your first judge and there were a lot of very wealthy young men and women. There were a lot of generational lawyers, but there were a lot of them just like me whose mm -hmm. parents were just like mine, who mm -hmm. grew up poor in the Great Depression, who they themselves were the first to go to college. Yeah. And it was really then I could see that path emerge. So I, as I left law enforcement and then I go to law school, I began clerking for a judge who grew up poor in the Irish ghetto of New York, mm -hmm. found his pathway out through, through the Marine Corps during Vietnam, then into the FBI and then into private practice and I became his law clerk. Wow. And it was literally our last day together as I was embarking on my new career as a solo practitioner. As he's throwing that hmm. file in the bin, he says, well, kid, what do you want to do? And I said, judge, I want to be just like you. I want to try a lot of cases, and someday I want to be a judge. And he said these words to me. Kid, you're so young, so ambitious, you could make it all the way to the Ohio Supreme Court. Wow. And I laughed at Judge Crehan and said, Judge, that's not possible. I'm not one of those. And in my 30s, I think I'm not one of those really meant, I believe, to run statewide. You had to be wealthy. You had to be politically connected. What I didn't realize was the promise of America is just that. It's a promise. Yeah. You can achieve your American dream as long as you follow the rules of my parents. Wow. Decide, commit, work hard, have great fortitude and you too can be a Supreme Court Justice. Isn't that great? That's it great. was an amazing 
Amazing. Yeah. That, those lights come on like that in life, and it's great to see someone who took advantage of it. That's excellent. What a great story. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you about our viewers out here and how they might be connected to the third branch of government, the, uh, onto the, state, uh, the Supreme Court. How are they connected to that? I think that your viewers are connected to the judicial branch just by the way the founders crafted this great country. So if you step back in time after declaring our independence, what are those things they say in the Declaration? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. We're endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among them are the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those rights that come from our Creator are protected against by the overreach of government. And how did the founders do that? By way of the Constitution. But if you look at the crafting of the Constitution, and there are multiple layers of separation of powers, but the overarching separation of powers is the Republic. We're not a democracy, we're not a monarchy, we're not a dictatorship. Yes, we have democratic undertones because we vote, but we're a Republic. Our voice rests with the legislative branch. The executive branch goes forth and gives effect to our will and the laws created by the men and women who represent us. But the third branch of government sits idly by and waits for the case and controversy to come to decide what the words are in yeah. the statute, not to rewrite it or legislate. We're even more connected to our third branch of government here because unlike the federal government, if you think about how judges are appointed, it's the president that makes the selection as confirmed by the Senate. And to remember that federal judges under the Constitution are appointed for life. And as a result of that and that process, we have little say other than our representatives and who we have as a president. But here in Ohio, we are even one step closer to that connection. Because in 1851, after the great debates at the Ohio Constitution Convention, we took back the power of appointing judges by the legislative branch to voting for judges. Mm -hmm. So we are connected like we are connected to our representatives. It was the gentleman from Fairfield County, Mr. Robertson, who, to paraphrase him, basically said, we have long endured this democracy, and we understand what it means to hold our elected officials accountable to us. And we hold them accountable every time November comes, and we either vote for them or vote them out. In the same way, he was saying, by taking over this power, by voting for our judges, we have the power to hold judges accountable to what we believe their role in government should be. You are so connected to your court system, whether it's your municipal and county court, your court of common pleas, all the divisions of it, your appellate court and your Ohio Supreme Court, because you elect the men and women who serve you, Bob. Same with all your viewers. Yeah. This is their government, not well, mine. Yeah, well, that's a, an excellent thing to understand, and I think our viewers probably just learned something. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, Act, judicial activism and judicial restraint happens, and I wonder if you could just talk to that for a few minutes and explain how important it is and why why we have that going on. Oh, excuse me, I can. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> there are two different ends of the spectrum, and it really comes down to what you believe the role of the third branch of government should be. Judicial activists would say that they believe mm -hmm. that they stand in the seat and they should move the law around or forward. It should be progressive. Uh, one of the most prolific speakers on this was the former Chief Justice Celebrees, who actually said that when God and the people made him the Chief Justice, he actually told the people he was not going to be a liberal or conservative judge. He was going to be progressive. And he was going to change the law to the way it, he best saw it fit for Ohio. That essence of judicial activism, when he makes the quote of, he believes judicial activism is necessary to dust off the laws of the books 
of the laws that no longer should exist or are antiquated. That's a different perspective from judicial restraint. Judicial restraint goes back to those founding principles. So if I take you back in time to our first conversation when we talked about the separation of powers, you know, the founders, if you think about it at that time, yeah. the colonists didn't have that great phone. They weren't getting the information across the colonies by way of phone or telegraph. Three men set about writing the Federalist Papers and explaining to the colonists why this first original constitutional supremacy form of government be, was so important, why they should ratify this form of government, why should we have a republic. And in writing the Federalist Papers and explaining why we should have a legislative branch and they should have these powers, and why we should have an executive branch and have these powers, at Federalist Paper 78, they began to explain why the federal judiciary should be appointed, not stand for election, and be appointed for life. In talking mm -hmm. about the separation of powers, they really reconciled that the courts, they themselves, the colonists should not fear them because they would only have reason. They would not have power of the taxation purse or power of the standing army. At the time that this grand experiment was being debated, in Independence Hall, Montesquieu, a great philosopher from France and a judge himself, said of all the branches, the judiciary would be the weakest, almost next to nothing. And really, we hearken judicial restraint as, because I wear a robe, I don't get an extra vote. I don't get to put my thumb on the scale of justice and say, this is the outcome that I want because Sharon Kennedy, the person, thinks this is best. I don't get to erase the words that you have commanded be written in your statutes. I don't get to add words to the statute either, Bob. All I get to do is give effect to the words that are written on the page. And if the General Assembly has defined those words, then I use their definitions. If they haven't defined those words, then I pull out the dictionary, commensurate to the time. Sometimes at the Ohio Supreme Court, we're called to decide what is the language of a provision of the Ohio Constitution that was written in 1911. We pull out a 1911 dictionary. What did those words mean then? What was the effect of what they were writing? What is the intent? That judicial restraint is iconic. President Reagan spoke <coughs> of what judicial restraint really meant at the investiture ceremony for Chief Justice William Rehnquist and Associate Justice Antonin Scalia. He said the question about judicial restraint, it, the question is never will we have liberal or conservative courts. The Constitution isn't liberal or conservative. The question is, as the founders put it, will we allow our republic to live? And the only way our republic works is if those who wear black robes and serve in the judiciary exercise judicial restraint, that they don't add their voice to the law. Because in this republic, our voice starts in the first box, the legislative branch. Yeah. That's exactly why judicial restraint is so important. It is why I am committed to judicial restraint. As a citizen of this great country, I do have a voice, just like you, Bob. I get to vote for the men and women I want to represent me. I get to pick up the phone and say there should be this law, but not that law. But I don't have a third voice because I wear a black robe and I have a pen to say what the law is. I don't have the opportunity to evade it or invade it and actually write something else. I tell young people, when they ask me why I wear a robe, to me, we wear a robe to insulate the law from ourselves, from our own personal views. And that's mm -hmm. why your viewers should care about judicial restraint. Wow, you know, I happen to be a big restraint guy, so I agree with everything you said. <laughs> Fantastic, we'll get along famously. <laughs> that's, that's my prejudice, but I do believe that's the way it should be, and we will not be a republic if it stops being restraint. You're exactly correct. The definitions, when these uh, laws in our Constitution were written, in many cases, the words mean something different now than they did then. Absolutely.
So if it's going to be, if we're going to hold to it, we have to go back and look and see how, what the heck they meant by that. Correct. So I'm really feeling better already that you're a judge. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> um, another question that I, I hear a lot about, and I think you can tell me about, the merit selection system in picking a judge versus electing one as we do in Ohio. Could you just talk to that a little bit and explain the difference? Well, obviously there are 50 states and there are 50 different ways to get here. So in 1851, we took the power to vote for our judges away from the legislative branch before they appointed all the judges. In some states, um, I'll choose Missouri because this is where it was first developed, they actually pulled together a series or a panel of individuals and they get to do what's called merit selection. Whether that's 10 people or 14 people, those people get to decide who should become judges as confirmed by a Senate or appointed by a governor. And then they stand for what's called retention election. Both models have pros and cons. Quite honestly, as someone who loves freedom and liberty and my right to vote, it's a constitutional right to vote for our judges in Ohio and I would never give up a constitutional right to vote ever. For all of those who say, well, the merit selection's better, if it's really better, why are merit states, some, trying to get out of it? So Florida went to merit selection. For 10 years straight, the General Assembly has tried to get out from underneath merit selection to go back to electing. Missouri is trying to get out of the retention election system from merit to retention election and go to a merit merit selection. In other words, their review would be they go back in front of the same panel because what you've seen in merit selection states is that outside money is now pouring into those states to have an effect in the retention elections. In a retention election state, those judges can't raise money or if they can, there are serious caps on that. They don't have the ability to develop those relationships, contacts, to have those kinds of traditional election toolbox that we have here in Ohio. Yeah. So you see $50 million <clears throat> trucked into some place like Iowa and three justices of the Iowa Supreme Court are um, unelected. They are not retained because they didn't get enough votes on their retention election. The other th peril that you see is most of these votes happen as a result of single issues. Mm -hmm. And when people tell me that, <clears throat> but Sharon, merit selection means politics is out of it. Really? Do you really think that 10 people even sitting around a table making merit selection, that politics is off the table? Politics is always involved in decision-making process in committees. You'll never evade that or avoid it. So for me, I'd rather have my politics up front and forward. I'd rather be able to go out and judge for myself who I am electing. It's so easy now with the internet to go out and find who's running for our judicial seats here in Ohio, whether that's here in Belmont County or in my home county of Butler, and who's running for the state Supreme Court. You have such opportunities to go out and meet them, speak to them, ask them about their view of judicial restraint, <clears throat> and make an informed view. So I'll stick with my constitutional right to vote. I think I would stick with that too. I, I like that. We're on the same page on a lot of this. <laughs> and I, I don't know anything about the law. <laughs> <laughs> but I do believe in the Constitution and the way it was written and we're supposed, we are a nation of laws. That's what I believe we have to do. I think the founders have given us a great gift. And if you go back in time and think about what was going through their mind in Independence Hall, the fights they were having, the debates, they walked out of the hall angry but always came back the next day. But think about the precious gift they have given us. Oh my. It, it's, uh, it's, un, it's almost, well, that's why so many people say this is a gift from God because it was so wonderful and so powerful what they did. It's not been done before and it hasn't been done since. You're exactly correct. And if, yeah. for all of those who say, well, America's not so great, if that's really true, 
why do so many th still thirst to come to America? There's mm. a reason. There is. And that, that is one thing that uh, I don't understand why people in this country who are citizens and who should know better keep saying things like that. Why is everybody at our door trying to get in? <laughs> and nobody is trying to leave. Exactly. And if they wanted to, they can go. <laughs> right? So I don't get that mentality. Um, another area that I wanted to go over is um, how young people might achieve their goals. Your story is just really touching and very powerful. Because I came from a family like yours. And I know what it was like for me to dig out of that and get where I wanted to go. It was not easy. <laughs> and I thought the same thing. I thought, this is not for me. Those people are somehow special. And that's why they get to do those special things. So would you maybe give some advice to the young people who might be watching this about how they can do that, what they want to do? Thank you. I think no truer words were ever said than what you just said. They aren't special people who get to achieve their dream. They're people who set their sights on their dream and never lose sight of it. I talk to young people about thinking in terms of blocks of time. And I've had the great privilege and opportunity to speak to many young audiences. And I still use this technique today. You know, I have a whiteboard at home and I have my next goal at the top of the board of what I want to achieve. And I write down below that goal everything I have to do in order to achieve that goal. And sometimes they have a specific order, but sometimes they don't have an order. It's just, I have to do X, Y, and Z. To put it in, in real terms for a young person today, <clears throat> let's say they want to run their own electrical company. They're in high school. What do they need to do? They need to go to a trade school, become an electrician, do the journeyman. Uh, there's a multitude of different opportunities of how to do that work, commercial or home. But if owning their own business and being an electrician is the top of the board, here's all the steps they have to do to get there. Secondly, in creating that board, find good mentors. Find people that will support you in your dream. I've had them my entire career. Mr. Shearing, as, as my high school teacher, taking that five minutes to inspire me and plant the seed. That law enforcement wasn't a ceiling, it was a floor upon which to build. Looking at Judge Creham, when I met him, he was a criminal <clears throat> defense attorney, I was a police officer. I was his law clerk. For him to plant the seed of I could make it to the Supreme Court. They're not special people. Showing me the pathway of how to engage in um, being an elected official, starting me out in a young person's club where we were politically engaged, helping on campaigns and understanding what that is, all of those tools. So by the time I put the word trial court judge at the top of my board, then I really knew what I needed to do. I needed to engage in my community. I needed to join civic organizations. I needed to go out and speak. I needed to have a broad-based practice of law. And I needed to have a good foundation of the practice of law before ascending to the bench. In getting to the bench, what were my goals then? I spent 14 years in the trial court, but always my goal was to make sure that when the families came through my court, their case was heard respectfully, efficiently, fairly, and to make sure that I could get them on with their life. So when that goal of being Supreme Court Justice hit that board, I went back to my roots. I went back to my core mentors. I went back to my mom. My father had passed by that time, but I went back to my mom. She was the first person I talked to, to talk about this new dream. I went back to Judge Crehan to say, I'm thinking about this. We had this conversation in 1991, and now I'm thinking about doing it. Talking to my friends who I had volunteered for in the political world, and really the tough questions that I had to answer for myself. You have to make sacrifices in life to achieve your dreams. Sacrifices will be made. But success is directly measured by the amount of work and sacrifices you're willing to make. When I had dinner with my friend, 
my greatest political advisor, Mick Krieger, he basically said, Sharon, you could do this, but here are the 10 questions you have to answer for yourself. And the first four, Bob, were really about giving up my life, my life mm -hmm. as I knew it. Running statewide across Ohio means you've got to be willing to be in your car a lot. As you, I bet. <laughs> as you joked as we were coming up the steps to sit into the studio, the reality is, is I'm everywhere. Follow me on Facebook, Sharon Kennedy. I'm almost at 5,000 viewers, so we're going to flip it to a political page of Kennedy for Ohio on November 1st so that I can go beyond my 5,000 uh, friends. But you'll see how many counties I'll touch in a day. I'll give three speeches or six speeches while still working. So if that means I get off the road at five o'clock at night and I start working and I work till midnight every night and I have case conference calls with my staff in order to get it done, that's what it takes. Yeah. But I think that really goes back to the rule of my parents, right? Yes, it does. <laughs> the three rules. There are only three rules to achieving your dream. Decide and commit. Put it on the board. Decide and commit. Work hard and have fortitude. You're not always going to accomplish it right off. You might see a hurdle or an obstacle, but that's not a ceiling. That's an opportunity to rise, to figure it out, to go through it, to go around it, to go over it, to find a new mentor to help you understand it and tackle it. But nothing stops you from getting to the top of your board. Nothing stops you from accomplishing your dream except for you. And finding those mentors is important because there are plenty of naysayers in your life. Right. I've had plenty of people who told me I wasn't smart enough to go to college. I wasn't smart enough to go to law school. I couldn't do this or I couldn't do that. What they saw are limitations. That's not me. There are no limitations in life unless you put them there. And it starts by saying these words, I can't. You can do anything you want to do. <laughs> the only rule, and those are my parents' rules, the only mistake you can make in life, as my parents would say, is not trying. Right. And the only setback is giving up. That is true. <laughs> Mary Pitford, who was a screen actress, once said, this thing we call failure isn't about falling down. It's about staying down, right. and that's a personal choice. Boy, that is so true. So fight on. That is so true. My catchphrase is, you never lose unless you quit. That's right. <laughs> if you don't quit, you haven't lost. Correct. <laughs> and you keep going for that goal. So is there anything else you'd like to add to this for us? No. Thank you, you for your said? opportunity to be here with you today. Great to see you. Thank you to all the viewers in the Valley. And I hope they enjoy our conversation today. Well, May God you. bless everybody. Thank you for joining us. It's been really a pleasure. Ohio State Supreme Court Justice Sharon Kennedy. Thank you. And that's it for this show. I want to, on behalf of the great folks at ESB Teleproductions, and I'm your host, Bob Connors, we want to tell you we will see you next time on the next edition.